Hey people, it's Nas Toki. Now before I bring you this story, so this is from The Guardian. The quiet failure of a Chinese developer's Manhattan in Africa. A refusal to include affordable housing led Johannesburg to address glossy plans for high-end housing, offices, a rail station, and entertainment district. It seems the city will get disconnected, car-centric, gated communities instead. The Gao train rushes through the green rolling hills and grasslands of Mother Fontaine, the community... The commuter's real school library recalling Johannesburg's reason for existence as a mining town and speeds past the platforms of the commuter station that never got finished. Four lanes of smooth tarmac lead over the horizon. Street lights evenly spaced and drop down so the curb make it easier for pedestrians to, close, to cross that in much of South, South Africa's biggest city, except there are no pedestrians. The paint still looks fresh and the mark is clear, but these roads are nowhere ain't in concrete and steel barriers. There are a few signs of what might have been. A pl- plan by Shanghai-based developers and Dai Group for a new city district of gleaming skyscrapers, high-end housing, offices, and an entertainment zone to be funded by a rand, 80 billion, 4.2 billion pounds. I think in U.S. dollars, it'd be like maybe 5.6 or 6 billion dollars. Hailed by, by an excited media as an African Manhattan or a New York for the continent. No, it's not an African Manhattan. It's a Chinese city in Africa. The view from the top of the tallest modern Fontaine Tower that passed over the densely packed Alexandra t- Township is the very real steel and glass of Johannesburg's distinct financial center in Santon, five miles to the west, where the latest sky- skyscraper, the 234-meter Leonardo, has just taken the crown as Africa's tallest building. Modern Fontaine was to be Johannesburg uh, to be. Was to be to Johannesburg what Eco Atlantic is to Lagos, Nigeria, a shiny new stop on the periphery of an African city that pro- uh, promised to fix all its existing problems. Beyond a few connected roads and street lights, the divine developers' dream never became a reality. Refusal to agree to Johannesburg's demand, authorities' demand for affordable housing, and planning permission was never granted. The land ended up being quietly sold and resold, as now in the hands of a company that appeared to be developing the site piecemeal into a series of gay communities. And they're absolutely right to. So their demand that some part of the uh, development should be for ordinary South Africans is an unreasonable one, that they should be able to make a huge profit with nothing for the community. The sale of land and failure of the project was never really publicly announced, says US UCL research fellow Francis Brill, who studied the case in depth with Ricardo Riborido from the University of Dublin. During a few-year period, Brill and Riborido interviewed 50 consultants, Architects, engineers, and local authority plans involved to piece together what happened. Did Monroe Fontaine's failure prevent the gap widening between an aspirational world class city project and the reality faced by the majority of Johannesburg's population, or should it be seen as a missed opportunity? The future capital of the whole of Africa. Back in 2013, when the project first hit the headlines, N9 Group Chairman Dai Zikang told the South China Morning Post that development would act as a hub for Chinese firms investing in sub Saharan Africa. With funds from the Bank of China, Zendai had bought Modra Fontaine from Heartland, the property development arm of explosives and chemicals company AECI. The area had been the site of South Africa's first dynamite factory until it closed in the 1990s. It included a 111-hectare, 275-acre private nature reserve, home to a dazzle of zebras, allowing the Zendai development to be branded a smart city and eco-city. It will become the future capital of the whole of Africa, announced Dai, whose company was best known for developing Shanghai's Himalaya Center. This will be on par with cities like New York in America or Hong Kong in the Far East. International consultants include Atkins and Arab Wire to draw a master plan for the 1,600-hectare site. In what would have been a ra- uh, radical departure for car-centric Johannesburg, the plan submitted in 2015 largely focused on transit-oriented development, cycling, and pedestrianization. A new Gao train station due to open by 2018 was to connect Modern Fontaine to the existing financial center in Santon in just seven minutes, with the airport six minutes in the other direction. There was talk of 50,000 new homes and 300,000 new jobs in what Atkins called the last available large development site in the city. But the city of Johannesburg, led at the time by Mayor Parks Tau, was insistent the site should accommodate 5,000 units of affordable housing. So, out of 50,000 homes that just 10% should be affordable, and that was unrealistic. It seems that they were just greedy. Zendai had clear aspirations of building a high-end, luxury, mixed-use development, which will cater to the elite of Johannesburg in much the same way as its neighbor waterfall, says Brill and Riborito in their paper, Failed Fantasies. It's got strong contrast with the aims of Zendai and their rhetoric. 
The city wanted the developer to build a more inclusive site which reflects the realities of the housing market in Johannesburg. Although Zendai and the city discussed social housing quite frequently and quite lengthily, there was little negotiation because the Chinese developer was clear it wanted to make China luxury housing. One engineer who worked on the project told Brill and Ribarito who anonymized all their so anonymized all their sources. And this is also about the importance of having power, both domestically and internationally. Because the Chinese have so much power internationally, they, when they came there and they were told, you, you need to negotiate, no, we have one vision. And they just kept going at it and going at it. When you don't have much power yourself, you either have the power to say yes or no. There's no middle way. A town planner employed by Zendai said the council wanted us to include social housing as part of, as a portion of the big, bigger development, which is a uh, developer I have issues with. Failure to accept the inclusion of social housing meant the developer was not granted planning permission for more than two years, while the Johannesburg authorities deliberated of what might be done to constrain the efforts to build an entirely new piece of city. While Modafontein was to be connected to Santon, the airport and downtown via a new Gao train station, it was not integrated into Taos Corridors of Freedom, BRT network. Yet yeah, a few infrastructural or service connections with the existing city, says Brill and Roberito, severely limiting transit opportunities for the majority of Johannesburg population, as Gao trains ridership is mostly composed of middle-class residents. In the words of Jack van der Moer, the commuter rail company's chief executive, our focus is on the car user. If you have enough money for a car, you have enough money for the Gao train. Despite announcing the start of construction with some infrastructure being built, the project stalled, Dai announced he was leaving property development and moving to the art market. He let us set up a 10 billion or yuan or 1.1 billion pound peer-to-peer -peer lending business, handing himself in last month to Chinese police investing in uh, accusations of illegal fundraising. Zendai Group sold Modern Fontaine to China Orient Asset Management Corporation which manages non-performing assets. They in turn sold the site to Pretoria-based developer M&T. M&T had been hard at work with a row of repetitive red boxes rising out of the dust along Centenary Road. Despite being marketed as luxury apartments, the red ivory lane properties each measure just 47 square meters, featuring one bedroom and a carport. They're separated from the road by a high wall, a soon-to-be gated community. Looking over printouts of the old plans in Arab Johannesburg's office at Melrose Arch, Transport Planning Associate Simon Van Jarsville, who worked on the Zendai proposal, says his failure meant the future of Modrofontein remains uncertain. The original plan had healthcare, schools, and community centers, he says. It was a self-contained city. We could have had a city with mixed use and people-centered design. This could be another missed opportunity for Johannesburg. If we end up with disconnected, low-density, gated communities that are very car-oriented. Brill, though, sees the rejection of a Chinese developer and a coterie of international consultants as a sign of Johannesburg's strength and a rare example of an African city that had the courage to push back against external investment that would have benefited only the elite. For many African cities, there is a huge gap between the aspirations to be a world-class city and the reality for the majority of the population, she says. The city of Johannesburg was very clear that Zendai's development won't get, wouldn't get through with our affordable housing, and it held out against pressure for two and a half years. I think there's something very positive in this. And I very much agree with them. They just had to say no. Because I went to London recently, and I saw, I went to a lot of places, and I saw, like, the gentrification. Like, I went to Battersea Power Station, and this is a part of, this is an old part of London in the south. Like, this used to be a building, and you, you see all this development, like, oh, it's been turned into luxury flats, and there's new buildings everywhere. And there's talk of a new... On London Underground Station being open to serve the area. Uh, the thing is, when you go there, there's all Americans there. There's all foreigners. There's, there's no... The only people local in the community that you come across are the employees of the area. Everybody who is there, who is from the community, doesn't get any access to all these new developments. And it's the same across London. You go to, like, one of the biggest um, developments in the last 30 years in the whole of London was the development of the London Docklands into Canary Wharf. Now, that benefited the city of London, but it didn't really benefit anybody in the Tower Hamlets area because, okay, you might get some a few jobs here and there, but overall it just increases gentrification. So people who live in the estates might get a few jobs as cleaners or stuff like that. 
but overall it just makes it harder and harder to live in the community. There's no actual wealth being brought in, it's just rich people who work in the community and who might buy up a few properties and live in them, but everybody else has very little improvement in their quality of life. Like, there is a thing called the Balfron Tower, and uh, that is in the area of Poplar in Tower Hamlets, which is you know, just a stone's throw away from Canary Wharf. And the, that has been sold from the Tower Hamlets Council to some private development company, and all the people who used to live in it, both who owned their f flats or apartments, and uh, re rented it from the council, they got moved out, and it's now just filled with yuppies who work in the city, either Canary Wharf or the city of London. And like I said, that's basically what all these developments mean for the people of this community. So that's what I mean. This is very good because all these developments in Johannesburg would have just been to create more gentrification and to steal more wealth from the already poor citizens of Johannesburg. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll leave the article in the description. Please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. If you want to support this channel, I'll leave my GoFundMe in the description. And I'll leave my Instagram there as well. Peace.